It's long winter Wednesday. But Jenny was playing Britney Spears before this. So we want to yeah. sing that instead. <laughs> we're jamming a Britney. We were jamming a Spice Girls. We got a 2000s feel going on. Heck yeah. Hello, hello, everyone. We're back. We took a little break because July has five Wednesdays and we had team time in the morning instead of the afternoon. And we're just like, you know what? We've been doing this for a few months. We feel good. It's a, it's a habit now. It's a thing that we show up for. And also we could take a break. We could have a day off. Yes, we were a little bit, a little bit tired. A little bit tired. It's a lot. We've been busy, busy. <sighs> Be like DEI consultants across the board from what I know. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah. <sighs> Some days you just show up for it. I'll show up. Well, that's okay. Yeah. The show. So hello, hello. If you're just tuning in, my name is Jenny Madrano. I am the shift program manager at Building Bridges. I use she, her, and hers pronouns, and this is Long Winded Wednesday, and I am here with my lovely co-facilitator. Would you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Marin Johanna Miller, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am the shift coordinator. Yeah, so yes. we're here today. Dream team. We are... Tuning in to our topic that we started feels like years ago, but July is a really long month. So the topic for this month is what does DEI look like in the future? What is what could it look like? And um, originally we wanted to have as many guests as possible. Turns out our people and friends are pretty, pretty busy. So that's totally okay. Today we're just going to do Marn and I's thoughts. So a good old fashioned long winded Wednesday with Marn and Jenny. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, we're trying to <laughs> you know, mix it up a bit, but. <laughs> and eventually we are excited because we want to transfer our lives into a podcast as well. So if you're like, oh man, I want to tune into this, but I can only watch this little snippet here and like add a comment or I like don't like using Facebook or whatever it is, no fear. We're going to have it in audio format soon, so you could listen that way in your car or, um, you know, washing dishes like I do or something. Hopefully this actual recording will be there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Marin, let's do a check-in question before we dive into today's topic, which is how long is the long game of DEI? What can you expect in this long game? Um, I'm thinking about what Hamida had us think about and team time. I'm wondering if there's a way to like pull that in of like, what is liberation and freedom and kind of like a bigger visioning ahead of like, just like when you think of the long haul and what could come of that? Like, what are you, what's, what are you visioning? Like what keeps you going and what are you working towards? That's good. Huh. What keeps you going? What is, I think about the long game. I think for me at this point, like I can't envision doing my life any other way mm -hmm. than trying, than being actively part of dismantling systemic oppression and white supremacy and all that. I think that's what keeps me in it. Uh, so it's kind of like, I can't, you can't unsee it. Like I took the, what pill is it? The blue pill or the red pill of the matrix? I don't remember, even though we watched it. <laughs> I know. I took the pill that makes you un not be able to see, not see things. That's the one. <laughs> and the matrix is visible to you now. <laughs> So on a theoretical level like that and then on a personal level it's like i feel like i'm also fighting for my own right to exist and lead and change the world yeah how about you hmm. 
Yeah, I also feel like um, I've tapped into the matrix and cannot unsee it. And therefore, specifically as a white person, have committed to and, and intend to be my life's work as well to um, not only, um, I mean, for kind of simultaneously doing my own work of unlearning and deconditioning, and also because of the work that I've done, the personal work that I've done influencing other folks to want to do that deep work in order to see and note that there are other ways um, of doing that. And that still definitely stems from my experience as a teacher and how my awakening started as in that context and really growing to this huge deep belief that school can be different, that adults can be different, that the way we relate with each other can be different. And so um, I'm committed to figuring that out because my own humanity and uh, like ability to, ability to be an authentic human being in this world is completely wrapped up into it. Like I want to help and continue to not only look at racism, but internalized sexism, ableism, just like there's all the, the layers that continue to need to be, there's one layer to be peeled and then that only encounters and brings forth more. It's like, a, we're like a little rope, like I've pulled on this rug and now I'm just keep pulling. Yeah, yep, totally feel that. So it's, we kind of have decided today's topic because when we're thinking about what does DEI look like in the future, um, one thing that Maren brought up is just a question that we receive from a lot of our clients that we're working with around organizational change. And that is timing. Yeah. How long is this gonna take? Where should I start? Should I start with a 12 month commitment, a six month commitment, and what's that gonna do? Um, and then not just clients, but people who come through our public training Maybe if you're watching this and either you've just started the journey of realizing how deeply racist our country is, or you've been in it for a minute, either way, it's like a lot of times there's this question of how long do I have to lean into this? And for white folks, it's like, at any point, like, is there an opt out? Like, do I get a break? <laughs> does, it, does this look like a season of my life, a job of my life or my life? Ooh. Oof. How long does it take, Martin? Can you tell me how many approximate years, minutes, and seconds? <laughs> One hour, two minutes, and 30. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and we've said this before as well. Um, whether it was in the midst of, of all things in June after George Floyd and uprisings that are still happening. Um, and just in general, um, just again, clients and stuff, like what does this actually mean? And I don't think some folks quite understand what long haul means. It literally means for the rest of your life as long as you exist on this plane, in this existence, in this body, specifically as white folks, there will, there will always be something to be in reflection around, around racism. As a cisgendered person, there will always be something for me to, that I just, I don't know, or that I'm now encountering because I have a person in my life that is giving me feedback or giving me another perspective or experience for me to deepen my understanding. So yeah, it's not, it's not a checklist. So we say this after especially our training, it's not a checklist. It's not a, um, I'm gonna read this book and I'm gonna have it all figured out. It literally is like any bit of self-development or self-growth. Um, it, it, is, it is there for you always. I would definitely agree that it takes approximately <laughs> a full human lifetime to be able to really do this, not even get this, to be no. able to lean into this unraveling of the mess that we've all 
participated in creating, yeah. specifically in the context of the US, oppression as a whole, a capitalist system that, that really puts some people on top with more privileged identities and people with more oppressed identities on the bottom. And this isn't even a critique on capitalism, but it's, it's, just, it's just what the US has come to is this mess of white men, cisgender, majority heterosexual men, able-bodied, born in the US, this crew of older dudes leading everything, dominating everything, dominating the Fortune 500 CEOs for a reason because it this is how the system was designed and so the long game long haul we use both those phrases interchangeably is a matter of undoing that yeah and we need me we need you Martin. we need other white folks out there we need other BIPOC folks out there we need people of diverse identities and we need some of those white male CEOs to wake up Mm -hmm. and step down, mm -hmm. move down from their position. Mm -hmm. That's what it's going to take. Probably all of them. <laughs> but people aren't ready for that conversation yet. Right. And the in conversations I've had with other white folks too, this idea of like, is there hope? Is there hope that if I... Um, put any energy towards this to look at racism around me, within me, how I perpetuate and are part of it. If I, if I try this, is there gonna, like, am I gonna feel good at a certain point, like by the end of this? And um, I also wanna like say to that too, that there's this very, there's always this both and of like holding the tension of of, of, of like, what does this look like? What are you grounded in and why are you doing this work so that you do stay, like white folks keep your critical race, race lens on and stay in this to do it. But there, I've had to come to terms around that it might, it probably won't be in my lifetime that I've kind of, I've come late to the game. It took me to my mid thirties to understand this and really in reality, how much time do I have left? And therefore it's not necessarily have hope that it changes within my lifetime but it's that I am influencing folks in my sphere in any way that I possibly can so that a new generation that the, that this continues on after me and it could be four five six generations after me that what truly I vision could happen maybe happens yeah and I think it's like I don't want this um long-winded Wednesday to turn into like a persuasion station, right? Because we're not trying to persuade you to, to do this necessarily. This is more so for the people who are already like, okay, I guess I'm committing to the long game, whatever that is, and, and are looking for like, what is this actually going to take? Yeah. Um, and from my perspective, what I've witnessed firsthand is just the amount of transformation. Like that's such a vague word, but like literally empowerment People throw around empowerment all the time, but let me tell you, I, there has been no other point in my life where I've felt as empowered as I feel now. Mm. And that didn't happen by accident. That didn't happen by one mentor. I've had many, many mentors in my life. For some reason, I'm a mentor magnet. And people are like, hey, 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 can I help you? Can I mentor you? It's taken a multitude of people and it's taken my own agency and understanding my role in this whole thing. Mm. And realizing as a woman of color, like, oh, it's not just a cool thing that I become a leader, that I become uh, an entrepreneur or a CEO eventually, like that's going to change systems. There's going to be ripple effects. There's going to be someone, I could be someone that help a lot of other Latinas see themselves doing that similarly, the person that I never had. And so that, that feels like super worthwhile for me and in remaining in this kind of work, knowing that that often happens for BIPOC involved in our trainings. And then on the flip side, there's all these other privileged identities that I've realized that are part of my own liberation. Like, I don't want to be an ableist asshole. I don't want to be 
an elitist asshole. Like there's all these different ways that I can continually be challenged. And be a less oppressive human being. Mm -hmm. Less oppressive, more liberated, Mm -hmm. fully liberated. (sighs) Yeah, and it like, I don't know. I think maybe because I have such an exclusion wound as part of my life story. I feel like a lot of people who come to Building Bridges have some kind of exclusion wound Hmm. um, where they have felt othered by one of their identities, rather um, whether it's like the social construct or your personality or like the fact that you're an artist or something. There's always this like story of othering that it seems like people share. So to create a space where we can talk about that and then see a multitude of ways to become even more inclusive feels really unique. Yeah. Work. Yeah. And one of our prompts as a staff team this, this week was to think about like, what are you grateful for in terms of being a part of building bridges? And that for me is a huge part of it is it does feel like we are modeling and recreating a new path of like what could what could this all look like and it's important to me as someone who was again a teacher and a part of a system that eventually I'm like I'm out I can't I can't be a part of this where can I be a part of something that feels authentic and um, I think yeah using the model that we have and the approach and posture we have is a huge part of that and why we I think we bring yeah we do we magnetize folks in and like it feels important for building bridges to continue to grow so that we can support in the ways that we're we're already able to systematically and in big big spaces and to you know to um, pull in the last long-winded Wednesday we had too of like tying into this idea um that there might be white folks specifically that you need to step down or the organization or the program that you have shouldn't actually exist. It's not, it's actually perpetuating um, and oppressive in itself. And so how are you able to get to a point of like real reflection and humility to potentially step back or reroute? Yeah. And in terms of like evaluating whether or not like what exactly is your role in the in the change of systemic oppression and the dismantling of it yeah are you meant to truly change your whole organization and fundraise thousands of dollars to make sure that dei development happens or are you meant to move down from your position are you meant to shut down your organization i think that one thing is going that will help anybody who's in this for the long game um, develop that evaluation lens, critical lens, is um, spending more time in, in uh, dialogue spaces that, that make you con- continuously reflect on yourself. Uh, because one thing I've noticed is that the pathway of DEI development really mirrors like the pathway of just like self-empowerment in general. Yeah. And just like if you would see a person who like maybe doesn't have a lot of confidence or self-esteem and maybe they're keeping themselves in an unhealthy relationship or um, a toxic family pattern or a toxic Mm -hmm. workplace, it's like the more critical lens you develop of why things are toxic and what healthy looks like, the less tolerant you become. So what can you expect? You can expect to have your tolerance level be a, a much lower <laughs> like you're gonna, gonna want to do it like you're yes you and I Marn we handle a lot of bullshit but also we have much higher standards in terms of the people that we even want to work with yeah for sure and that what you just described takes time whether you like it or not it does and so it is it is that constant reminder that you must go slow to go fast. You must go slow at the, what does Adrian Marie Brown say of like, to the, to the level of trust of like, that there is, that this takes years, 
maybe decades. And the stem of the idea of our discussion today too was, was literally an organization asking us, you know, like we have a huge amount of staff. How are we going to get, can we, can we get a hundred percent staff through training through this? And it's, and um, there was like hesitation of like, is that possible? And it's like, well, yeah, it's possible, but we're not going to do it in a year. We're not going to do it in six months. Like, who can we move? Who can we get to this year? Maybe that's 20%, not even. That's okay. That's a win. And then those people will influence another group or, you know, like, so it's again, that sphere of influence and allowing time to truly like for this to kind of grow. Um, and really to be realistic of a lot of transformational change. Um, yeah. You're not going to see some real results three, four, five years into it. And you have to, again, be so rooted in why that you're willing to be in the mess of those years of making mistakes, of learning more, of figuring out what does this actually look like? And you might try something one year and then realize, oh shit, that didn't work. Now we have to start over, <laughs> start over and try something else. So then that feels like, oh my God, we failed, but actually no you've learned a whole hell of a lot and now you're going to try this. And again, par that's parallel to the self-empowerment journey that yep. every human goes on. Yep. You don't, you don't spend, most people wouldn't spend three years in a difficult situation, um, spending money on d their own self-development, maybe counseling or something. And by the end be like, well, that was a complete waste. Like that I didn't get the outcomes that I wanted out of it. Therefore, it was not helpful. Like typically, if you spend money on your own self-development, you're going to figure out some kind of uh, truths, gems that you can gain from the experience. Yeah. You're going to learn from your mistakes. And that's the same thing that we offer with DEI development. It's not a solution. It's like I, I tell our clients when we're working with them sometimes, like as DEI consultants, we are both a doctor and a therapist. And as doctors, it's our job to listen to you, what pain points are going on in your organization? How can we kind of diagnose the symptoms and um, figure out what's the best way for healing? Um, but then also there's that therapist lens that kind of has to be applied to of what does it look like for a group to develop together? How do you dialogue? How do you work through conflict? because this is going to take a while. Yep. Yeah. And that's why we've also like we've like you said we've learned to have better boundaries around who we work with and like just an understanding like trying to get a better understanding of like what are people's actual expectations thoughts around it but also like investment in it um because what we saw in june was this like frenetic experience of in the moment i need to do something now i'm feeling so uncomfortable and <clears throat> and there being like this feeling of pressure like that we had to like give everything and have all the answers for folks and it's and it but then like also like sitting back and be like are y'all going to be here next month? <laughs> like, <laughs> some of them aren't. Some of them aren't. Some people have already dropped out of the race. <laughs> out of the long game. They're like, the, hey, the relay, <laughs> the marathon. Like, I didn't make sure. I don't think this game is actually for me. Like, I'm going to go hide in the corner. And shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no, but get curious about that. If that's yeah. you, yeah. I mean, seriously, like if you're not, if you are hiding from it or in the corner or just kind of like, I'm going to check out for the time being because June is a lot and I try to read all the things and do all the things. And I realized just how much I have to grow and it was overwhelming. Fine. That's real. And also every day <laughs> goes by where this shit is still happening. People are still dying. People are still in cages. People are still shot for no reason. So it's like, it's sobering, but like, mm -hmm. like literally your privilege could prevent uh, death, you know? So it's like, 
keep that in mind as well. Yeah. Sobering and like important to always come back to. Yeah. Something else I was thinking around like um, expectations for the long game and what it all entails. Oh, it goes back to the tolerance thing. So I think in the more time you spend in this kind of work, the less tolerance you're going to have for bullshit, the less tolerance you're going to have for disrespect, especially if you are in a marginalized identity of some sort, that's the essence of liberation. Mm -hmm. We want you to get to a point where you stop taking bullshit from people of privileged identities who are telling you that just because they hold the privileged identity and you hold the traditionally oppressed identity, you should be less than, or you should be inferior. And when we're working with BIPOC folks, that's a huge part of my work is um, explaining that just because the system has been set up in this way, doesn't mean that it's gonna continue that way. But you as an individual are a huge part of the change. You can't, we can't sit back and be like, well, I hope other brown and black people like change things. No, it's like, it's gonna take every single one of us speaking up, taking space, leading, challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we talk so much about race and it's just like, it goes so much deeper than that when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, like young people, that's been mm. an awesome thing that happens within building bridges. Like we need you, Gen Z, like you're on fire. Like Woo! awesome to watch you. Yeah. Um, and like, people don't expect this from you. People don't expect that systemic change is gonna happen at your leadership, but I see it happening already. Yeah. So whether or not people want to listen to you, like it's time to, for me, I'm trying to find spaces where you get a mic mm -hmm. and yeah, you share what you need to share. I was thinking about that the other day in terms of just like Marin, 18 year old Marin. <laughs> I was, there was no way I was to the point that I'm seeing so many Gen Z folks and like even the the kiddos or the young adults that I had the pleasure of teaching like I there to see the lens and the way that they're able to articulate and know things and speak to power and systems is like beyond me and it's super exciting oh Let's yeah go. I remember being 17 in this like Chase Leadership Academy program so that I could get a scholarship and we had like this section where we had to do mock interviews yeah and I was so nervous and all I had to do was like shake this accountant lady's hand and tell her why she should hire me. I was like, uh, hello, my name is Jenny. And, then, and now I see like our Gen Z alumni and they're just like, so climate change, what are we going to do about it? The revolution starts with us. Come at me, please. And I'm just like, okay, this is a new wave of, of leadership. Yes. And then like, if we're talking long game, like that has a huge part to play in, um, in the long game is bringing in younger people. And for me, I think even having the elementary ed background, I'm like, the little babies out there, our baby kids, our children, we cannot underestimate them. Nope. They're soaking up everything that's happening during this pandemic. They're soaking up all the change, all the stress, everything. And I'm not a parent, so I'm not trying to speak down to parents who have children of their own, but I have worked a lot with children. I know and love them. And I feel like it's never too early to start bringing in these seeds of education on what does systemic change look like? Yes. And how to think critically for yourself and not just follow the, the school of fish or whatever. Yes. Yes, it feels really important. And that's been, you know, quite a few conversations I've had with white folks, white folks specifically in the midst of kind of sense of urgency and panic of like, I can't be out in the streets. I can't be protesting. What do I do? I, I'm not, I can't, I, I'm not able to do this, this or this. And it's like, you need to figure out what your role is and what your capacity is. And for a lot of folks, you're a parent. And so how are you doing your work in order to continue to, like you said, influence and support 
our kiddos to to do better and be better and not grow up the way that you did that I did that in terms of just not understanding those things for a very long time and yeah I feel like a lot of it comes down to um just simplifying you know like with the teacher lens anything can be made simple the yep. better you understand it the more simpler you can make it yeah. and so when I think about white supremacy cultural traits that's something we talk about all the time within building bridges. Some of those being an either or mentality, a tendency for power hoarding, uh, perfectionism, um, or the worship of the written word. Those are things that are so simple. They could start with younger people. They could start with teens or um, middle schoolers or elementary age children who can be challenged on their tendency to power hoard their tendency to think it's either this or that and there's no in between um, and then it can be stopped where the worship of the written word isn't inherited to the same degree mm -hmm. i feel like i have my own biases around like grammar and spelling and all that and i'm like can we just stop like the can we just stop the cultural thing the grammar policing <laughs> grammar policing like yeah oh it's so not helpful and i've seen how it's really um it's really held back adults that i know yeah and including and there's they're using it as a tool for for um power as well they're wielding power through it and they don't realize it yeah it's like does it is it really does it really really matter that i missed an a in that word yeah like is that really going to change the course of this whole training yeah feels like a power trip when people correct spelling and grammar on things and that's a personal Ooh, that's a journey i've been on. i mean that was in high school that was a normalized thing like to take this one grammar class like it was the really cool thing to do and once you went through this class like the teacher was super cool and like everyone who went through it was like a part of this crew of like we know better and we like always correct people on things and i think i found like power in it too because i'm also someone who has dyslexia and so like always do that feel felt like inadequate in in grammar in things and so i have seen like after reading how that is part of like white supremacy and power hoarding like it's so real it totally is <laughs> and mostly like when people correct spelling or grammar or things like that's like you knew what i meant you got the majority of it there's no need for you to say that no, I and it's like about that. I feel like when I hear grammar police, it's like that there is this assumption that everybody has received the same type, I won't even say level, the same type of education that you received. Yep. So you had an awesome grammar teacher like you had, Marin, or you had literally like three years of this yep. where teachers were like, nope, the apostrophe goes here, or this is I before E except after C. Like in my, pers in my personal experience, I don't remember receiving a strong foundation of grammar and spelling. Mm -hmm. I only remember like two classes on grammar maybe. And the spelling was definitely part of elementary school, but it wasn't that important. Mm -hmm. So like that was my school. There's all different kinds of schools out there. There's some people who like haven't had that emphasis so how can we assume that everybody's going to think and write like that? Huh. Ooh, didn't know we were going to tab into that, did we? <laughs> we're talking about the long haul and we go to grammar. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it. It is. Free the spelling. Yes. So it is. It's finding those spaces and places of like, I've, I've always thought this or this is my experience of this. And how am I opening and softening to that there are other experiences and there are potentially a lot of other ways to be around this concept or this idea or this way of being and like where can I be open to some of that and also maybe like reflect like is this actually working for us no like where where could we go instead yeah if you haven't noticed things are changing very quickly things are shifting there's space in the collective there's space in the world for a change to start happening or to really like get be getting momentum 
And so one thing I would say that you can expect, whether or not you are an active participant in the long game of dismantling systemic oppression, everything's going to be different. Like things are changing. And I feel like I've heard this from our friend to say to a lot of times, mm -hmm. they've said, um, the old, like pretty much like the old way is gone. Don't expect that to come back up. Yeah. Things are going to metaphorically burn, maybe physically burn. I don't know. I've already. <laughs> but old systems are crumbling. They just can't exist with the level of awakening that's happening collectively. Yeah. You can only keep people super exploited and working within these systems as long as they're numb to it as long as they're unaware of, of their own power. When we realize our own power, it's game over. Like, it's like the whole thing's gonna start shifting. And that's what gets, I don't know, like what is it gonna take for us to get such a, I mean, we are seeing that across the world with Black Lives Matter in general um, and what has happened over the last couple of months of the uprisings, but like, we still need way more folks to like, be ready like I, I feel like if not now when like with with maybe opening school again like the, here's another opportunity of like okay we can actually rethink this whole thing and unions can be setting themselves up to be like nah we're not coming back unless this this and this and parents you don't you want your kids to go to school because you want your own time back and you want you know be to be able to do the things you did while kids were at school like how are you gonna show up for public schools, for your schools? What are you gonna help change and, and um, advocate for? Like, I feel like there's some very real tangible things like, okay, so now are you gonna? Cause here, here's, here's some real ways that we need to show up. And are you going to? And it kind of feels like it's like these moments where in the past decade I had, I found myself thinking, when would that, how could that ever change? Like the only way it could change would be long-term um, minuscule inch by inch changes like the public school system in the US. Now it's like literally like exactly what you were spelling out. Like there is this opening, this gap in space and time where there's possibility and potential for creativity ideation, innovation, a new way forward. That's nothing like post-industrial US. That's nothing, there's no industrialness about it because we're no longer factory workers. We're literally, um, we have technology that can allow us to just innovate continuously and quicker than ever before. Yeah. And you were, I don't know if this was in a, in Long Way to Wednesday or one of our own conversations, you were mentioning that too, just like organizations who want to do diversity, equity, inclusion, but they're coming from this lens of this is how we do things versus what you just mentioned. Like what, if, what about that there's actually opportunity for creativity, innovation, doing something different, looking at like, we're not trying to fit back into how or what we were doing before, but like, where can we really have conversations and um, take the time, as we're saying, the long haul to truly like, what can we do better here? Like, let's actually do better here. <laughs> yeah, when before in our lifetime have we had such a pause yeah. on everything with this pandemic, a pause on the way work happens, a pause on like literal, literal traffic. Yep. And yeah, it's just like, it just seems like there's an op opening. So the long game, the long haul, I don't imagine that it's gonna be us having to just make tiny changes over the course of like a century, hoping that things change. Like literally 2020, there is this opening for the long game to look completely different that I never expected in terms of how how quickly change could happen because with people opening up to the possibility of DEI development and handing power over to consultants like us all of a sudden now we have responsibility and the ability to influence who's in power and within all these organizations mm -hmm. I'm talking about me and you and all the other uh, especially people of color facilitators out there who are getting to speak to powerful people 
and tell them, hey, it's actually time for you to move over, <laughs> make space for these other voices. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> and the move ideas over. are already there. Like there's so many ideas um, and I could speak from my own experience, but for many people I know who have had to live with marginalized or oppressed identities, be it race, gender, ability, citizenship status, like you have to think so out of the box to figure out how to navigate daily life. I have to think about all the ways in which um, being a woman or being a Latina is possibly preventing how people see me. So let me come up with creative ways to show them how awesome I am. And it, when you have all these people having that much innovation, suppressed innovation and out of the box thinking at the bottom of your organization, when you give them a voice, they're gonna be like, oh my God, I had no idea that Lisa even thought like that. And it's gonna be like, no duh, but like, yeah, listen, because she's been thinking about it for years and years and years. And you, it barely just crossed your mind in June. I'm gonna let that sit there for a second. <laughs> like that's just that's some gold right there. Wow, it's already 115. It is. I feel like that was like a whole like rabbit trail of things. I know. <laughs> that's what happens. It's all right. So if you're watching this and you tuned in at any point or you're watching this after the fact. Thanks for staying. Yeah, thanks for checking in. Hopefully it, it makes some kind of sense. <laughs> it's a journey always. Yeah. Okay. Check out. So what you're saying is the, the long haul takes about 33.333 repeating years. <laughs> <laughs> cool, 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 cool. Yeah. <laughs> nah, we said it. We'll say it again. It's going to take your whole lifetime. It's going to take our whole oh, yeah. It's going to take generations and also there is this opening yeah like you said simultaneously like the little inchworm but also like whoa okay wasn't expecting that i had this power but we there's so many of us that have a positionality that we've never had before and what are we going to do about it in this moment now yep <sighs> okay All right. words tell me or check out what are two feeling words you feel right now after this LWW. That doesn't really have a good ring to it. LWW. It doesn't. <laughs> All of that. Oh, it's like a weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I feel both like expansive and like dense, like. I think that's where I sh where I'm. It's a place to be always, is like the severity and the like realness and the density of why this needs to happen and why I, as a, specifically as a white person, should be engaged in racial equity and transformation in myself and the spaces I'm in, and also like to talk about it, to to think about it, to have permission about it, and word and like language around it feels really cool and exciting. How about you? I feel weighty, tired, and eager. Mm. Okay, well, thank y'all for tuning in. Hopefully you got some good gems, had some time to reflect on your own thoughts and processes around the long game of DEI. And we will be back on next week, next Wednesday. See you then. Bye.